Some people inside the freedom movement don't agree that anarchy is like the best path to go, but they still respect people in the movement. But what if we told you that anarcho-capitalism actually destroys liberty? We're talking with Greg Salmieri from the Ayn Rand Institute about some of the issues discussed in this book, Foundations of a Free Society. And it's very interesting to me, Greg, that uh, there's a whole section of why anarcho-capitalism doesn't work, but also that anarchists are collectivists. Mm -hmm. It was quite surprising uh, to me reading that anarchism is a logical outgrowth of the anti-intellectual side of collectivism. I could deal with a Marxist, Anne Rand said, with a greater chance of reasoning or at least getting to some kind of understanding with much great respect that I could do with an anarchist. Why did Ayn Rand have uh, such a strong view against anarchism? Yeah, I mean, in a sense, what she says anarchist there, I guess she means these allegedly um, libertarian anarchists, since Marx, Marxists in a way are anarchists, ultimately. Mm -hmm. And I think the idea is that the, 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 if you're going to take an idea like anarchism seriously and uh, see what it follows to, it leads to the kind of leftist Marxist uh, anarchism. Um, let's live together in communes. We can't have property. We can't have... Uh, large corporations. If you really think about what property and corporations are, uh, what freedom is, it's freedom from other people's force. And mm -hmm. if you think about what the anarchists, an alleged anarcho-capitalists want, it's it's basically gangs, and they they dress it up in nicer language. But it's gangs imposing themselves as protection agencies uh, against one another, and that is. Um, she had such contempt for that view because she thought it it's a contradiction in terms. And it's something she says elsewhere about them is there's, um, it's a view that's disconnected from reality because there are examples of it all over the place. And the, the anarcho-capitalists don't recognize them as examples. So the mafia and the wars between the mafia in, yeah. in um, on North America, or the Crips and the Bloods and other street gangs, right? How is that different from what the anarcho-capitalists call for? And if one looks, I think one sees that it's actually, that is the literal instantiation of their views. You mm -hmm. have governments competing with one another, and what you got is the state of the world we have today. Mm -hmm. um, it's an amoral and a-philosophical, ultimately, I think, view. And that was her doing this. She had a real kind of contempt for it. Now, there are, I think, some smart people who have talked themselves into this view. And we have uh, some people who I think are bright, uh, even in this collection, who are anarcho-capitalists, one of them arguing for it. Um, so I think uh, there's a, a wide range of views that intelligent people have, but I think there's something really basically contradictory about anarcho-capitalism, and uh, Rand certainly didn't just think that she had a real contempt for it. She then goes on and says, anarchists are the scum of the intellectual world of the left. So the right picks up another leftist uh, discard. That's the libertarian movement. Um, and she had this view, but I, I don't understand why she says that she could even have more points in common with Marxists than with anarchists. In, in what possible ways could Anne Rand feel more comfortable uh, agreeing with a Marxist than with an anarchist? Yeah, I mean, I think not quite hyperbole, but it was meant to be a dramatic example. I mean, yeah. the kind of clear-cut case of anarchists, particularly if you're someone of Ayn Rand's age, mm. um, who would remember the 30s and, and so forth, Right in the 20s before that, uh, and even World War One, that was you know she was very young then, but this was recent memory. Right, you think of, of um, Sacco and Vendetti, and you think of these kind of anarchist movements that were terrorists and blew up bombs, and you have a kind of resurgence of that kind of thing in the Antifa movement, street gangs who are just toughing and fighting, and that's an anarchist, and you're like, that's what you think is an intellectual movement, some hoodlum. And then if you think we're now back in the 1960s, right? Um, we mentioned in an earlier uh, segment that, that 1971 New York Times Magazine article about the libertarian movement. So that has a, a, a sentence in it. I don't know if I can quote it exactly from memory. Yeah. That says, you know, there are two real differences in the libertarian movement, two distinctions, uh, whether we want limited government or whether we want anarchism. Mm -hmm. And whether we want to affect change through peaceful means or whether or we revolution. want a rebellion in the streets. 
Yeah. And then it says, you might think these are big differences, but really they're not. They're little small things. And um, so one, that I think is crazy to think those are small differences. But second, the, the rebellion in the streets, the violent revolution, goes with the anarchist side of it. At least at that side. There were people who weren't that. But the, it's the, the anti-government, Antifa-like activists, let's tear it all down, let's burn it down. That was the, the kind of anarchist wing as she was seeing it. And it's not just in that book, the uh, uh, article, uh, an article by um, um, John Hospers, who had once been a friend of Ayn Rand uh, and was the first libertarian presidential candidate in the U.S., or one of the first, came out around the same time making the same point. Well, it's no big deal whether it's, you know, a war in the streets or a political change and whether it's anarchy or, uh, or small government. This view, it's that kind of person that she's thinking of, both the kind of thug in the streets, yeah. And the person who thinks, well, there's no real difference from the thug in the streets versus some kind of Marxist professor whose views she thinks are crazy, but at least he's, um, you know, there's a kind of erudition and remnant of civilization to that view. Um, but it's, you know, it's even a Marxist. It's not like I'm um, yeah, 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 I keen get it. to chat with a Marxist yeah. professor. With uh, I know a lot of anarcho-capitalists in Latin America anarcho-capitalists and Catholics at the same time. Like, uh, they are very suspicious of, you know, like organized government, but they don't care about organized religion. I, I don't even know how um, uh, that religion would work in their uh, anarcho-capitalist society without some, like, adoctrination, you know, from, from, from the way they, they see it. But one of the things that they tell me is the reason why an anarcho-capitalist society doesn't exist yet is because if you put one, eventually some other government will invade you. So you would need the whole planet to give up on their current governments to anarcho-capitalism uh, And that's exactly what the Marxists thought, right? Mm -hmm. So why isn't the communist revolution happened? Well, it has to happen of all the workers at once. Otherwise, uh, the capitalist countries won't do I mean, this is... This is the kind of, um, and this is an, an example of the collectivism of it. This right. is the kind of thinking that collectivist movements have. It has to happen everywhere, all at once, uh, or it can't happen. Now, uh, why are anarcho-capitalists collectivists? Because I, I think that that would be uh, shocking for them. I, I don't think that none of them, or at least the ones that I know, would consider themselves collectivists. But in page 2034, uh, sorry, 234, Harry Bing's Wanger says, only a collectivized mentality can hold that the police acting on my behalf cannot forcibly exclude competitors, but a defense agency can. Put it this way, a proper government is a defense agency and to carry out its mission, it can't let competitors use unsupervised force. The telling difference between a proper government and a private defense agency is that a proper government is placed under objective control. So what makes anarcho-capitalist collectivists in uh, the objectivist view is the fact that they want to have um, security and justice privatized without an objective standard? Yeah, that's one way of thinking about it. I mean, I think in the end it is collectivistic, but I don't think that's the the lens that most quickly captures it. It's, it's the way I would put it, it's opposed to freedom. Okay. And it's opposed to what freedom actually is, the freedom of the individual. Mm -hmm. And what it resorts to instead is defending yourself by finding a gang. Mm -hmm. And this is my gang, and they're the ones I've got to defend me. So it's, in effect, my gang versus your gang. And in that sense, it's, it's collectivistic. But if you think about, like, what freedom is, freedom is freedom from other people imposing their will on you by force. Freedom is you have a sphere where you can make your choices. You can make the choices you need to lead your life to um, uh, reap the fruits of your labor, to you're free to lead your life without other people interfering in it. And um, that's what freedom is. It requires um, a certain kind of society. Freedom is not something that we have uh, in nature. It's, I mean, what we have in nature is anarchy. What we mm -hmm. have in nature is people at one another's throats. It's a, a developed view um, that, you know, there are, there's a certain sphere that's your life and a sphere that's my life, and I shouldn't interfere in yours and you shouldn't interfere in mine. And developed social institutions to uh, recognize that and to extract force, the way Rand puts it, is extract force from society, yeah. extract force from human relations. 
And the way you extract force from human relations is you, in effect, say nobody can use force unilaterally. Uh, that's not all you have to say. You have to say about how it ought to be, what ought to be done with it. But a big part of it is it, it can't be used unilaterally. It's never up to you to use force yeah. uh, as an individual because if it is up to you to use force as an individual, then you're always under the threat of some other individual deciding to use force against you. And uh, force is not uh, forces to be used only in, in, in retaliation, but importantly only in accordance with certain objective procedures. And for the procedure to be objective to you, that you can tell, yeah. not, you might not tell, but you can tell if you're being rational that this force is justified, this force is right. Um, it can't be that someone else just gets it into his head to retaliate against you, and he does, or his agency does. The force has to be used in the name of um, an authority that you yourself can recognize that you're not under the sway or control of some other gang for it to be objective. So that's one part of it. And, yeah. and the other part of how it's not really for liberty is if you think about, and it's destructive of liberty, is just think about the idea of anarcho-capitalism. It's we're going to have capitalism, we're going to have a free market for force. Yeah. We're going to have a free market for retaliatory force. But what does that mean? What does the free in free market mean? that you don't have any restrictions, mm -hmm. that you cannot impose uh, economic privileges that will harm uh, other one to become an entrepreneur yeah. and, and make is, competition. But what is the restrictions? So the restrictions are things that are imposed. Imposed how? By a government, like a tax barriers or a monop like artificial monopolies. Yeah, but then how does the government impose it? They impose it by force. Yeah, and because so, constitutionally there's no separation mm -hmm. in between economics and the state. Right, but the, what a free market is, is a market that's free of force. Yes. And a government is needed to get the force out of the market. Yeah. And then it, it, it better not then come back in and introduce more of its own force. I mean, the, too often they do. I mean, I think that if, if, if you leave force to the market, mm -hmm. what happens is that you, you don't get anarcho-capitalism, you get anarcho-cronism. Uh -huh. Because the person with the most money mm -hmm. will get their way uh, violently, yeah. and this is what I see in Latin America. Like, uh, for example, for me, uh, anarchism or anarcho-capitalism doesn't work, or it already works. Where does it work? In favelas, where the biggest gangster is the uh -huh. one that inputs their their, their rules, or uh, in territories where the drug cartels mm -hmm. are, and uh, or or Pablo Escobar. I mean, mm -hmm. Pablo Escobar uh, amounted. Uh, I, he, he got a lot of power in Colombia. Mm -hmm. He kidnapped uh, in one day more than a hundred mm -hmm. uh, people near the government. I mean, I've seen anar anarchism uh, function because mm -hmm. of, of, of inefficiencies of government, but it never ends in capitalism. Uh -huh. It ends in anarcho-cronism. So people with more money, those are the ones who control the force. Uh -huh. And because what it is, what anarchism is, is, is the rule of force. Mm -hmm. And this is, again, Rand's point of, these are the literal examples of their theory. Yeah. And it's, um, but I want to get to the idea of a free market is a market from which force has been excluded. Yes. And there is no force in it. If there's force in the market, um, it's not free. So if, if, if I, you know, uh, holding a gun at your head, yeah. say, you know, sell me this this necklace for this much money, yeah. and you do, that's not a free market. Of course. Um, so until my gun is put away, yes. our trade isn't a voluntary transaction. It's a voluntary transaction only when each person in it knows I'm free to walk away. I don't have to deal with this person. Mm -hmm. um, so long as the guns are out, so long as the, the force is in play, it's not a free transaction. And so you can't have a state where you're bargaining on a free market for how we're going to use force. So long as how we're going to use force is up for grabs, it's not a free market. It, it's, it's force. And there's actually, a, you've got the book all nicely marked up. I don't remember where it is, but in Ankar Gatte's uh, piece in this book, yeah. there's a, uh, an amusing example. I think it's a really telling example of how he was, uh, as a child, uh, driving through Ethiopia, his his father had uh -huh. uh, a job there. I don't know if he mentions it was Ethiopia in the book, but it's um it's some place that was effectively in a state of anarchy. I believe it was Ethiopia, and it's a there's a, a, a an example about a person 
who comes up to the car the family is driving in with a machine gun on his back and uh, says something that he can't quite understand because they're not speaking the same language. Yeah. And they don't know what the guy wants. And eventually they decide to give him a banana. Maybe that's what he wants. And they give him the banana and he smiles at them and walks away. And okay. Uncle is like, was this a free transaction? We still don't know. Was the guy going to shoot us if we didn't give him the banana? Was mm. he? It's not a, you know, here's a guy with, and it's not just because he didn't speak English. Yeah. That like the guy, you know, it, it's, we, this guy had this gun. It was illustrating power over us. We didn't have any, there's an authority we can turn to, to, uh, to prosecute him if he attacks us. It, we don't know the terms on which we're interacting. And when you're in a state of anarchy, that is the state you're in with respect to other people. And that is not a state where you, a negotiation that you're doing about who's going to defend who is not a free uh, transaction in that state. Now, what about if, if you can have mafias that are more efficient than the government? Uh, for example, I think of the, the Godfather, the movie, uh -huh. right? Uh, if you are under the Godfather's uh, keep, then you're, you're quite safe in your neighborhood, right? And, and you could say that the Godfather, you know, he was like a, a, an efficient ruler. So what if the, the, the point that the anarchists make is, listen, between a government, a crony government, a corrupt government, or a bunch of mafias, I'd rather have a bunch of mafias. Well, let's think about the governments we're talking about. Yeah. So you can imagine a government that's so bad in some place mm -hmm. that you're better off with the protection. The government's failed. It's not working. You have no protection. And all you can do is turn to the mafia. Yeah. And if you look at The Godfather 2, where they show how Vito Corleone gets into being a mafioso, they're making the case that for Italian Americans in certain neighborhoods in certain years, it was really like that. And maybe yeah. that's true for uh, those people in those times. I doubt it, but maybe. And if you look at the Crips and the Bloods in California and you read biographies of these people, they talk about how badly the government had failed in these black neighborhoods, how much uh, violence, and, and maybe they thought this was their only option. Yeah. I think they were wrong that it was their only option. Maybe they were right. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that is a horrible, sad state of affairs. It's not how things are most of the time for most people and what we should be moving to. Right. Maybe in Venezuela right now that's true. Yeah. There are probably other places where the government is so bad that it's effectively brute force all the time and the best you can do is have some mob to protect you. But for most people living in America, living in England, living in Germany, living in France, living in Japan, living, you know, you can come up with the worst countries ever and yeah. say, Maybe the mob is less bad than the worst people in those countries have it. But now, seriously, you can live in New York City. You can live in Mexico City. Even you could live in um, Paris. Uh, and you think it's better to live in some, you know, uh, no-go area in Paris where the government isn't really in charge. Uh, that's better than living, uh, you know, in the left bank or whatever or living... Um, in Greenwich Village or the Upper West Side, it maybe there's some place somewhere where it's so bad that the mafia rule is less bad than the alternative. And this is what Harry Bingswanger points out uh, in the book, where he talk about, where he talks about force, uh, and he mentions Bastiat and says Bastiat summarized well the reason why respecting others' rights is to everyone's self-interest because you can have uh, three alternatives: everyone plunders everyone, some plunder others or no one plunders anyone. The first leads to universal destruction, like the, the worst case scenarios in the world. The second is contradictory because, you know, some plunder the others, uh, or involving a double standard. And the third is to the interest of every individual. So at the end, you always want to point out to uh, where does the individual can live better with like a better quality of life? Mm -hmm. Not like what's the, the, the least worst of all your options. Yeah, and it's it's, you know, maybe there's some place that, some government somewhere that's worse than some anarchies. Mm. But hardly anywhere ever, if the best you could do is, you know, 
better be in、uh, anarcho capitalism than being murdered by Stalin right now. Yeah,、uh, maybe they're right, but that's、uh, hardly praise for a system. So that that leads me somewhere.、Uh, when is it justifiable for people to rebel against their government?、Uh, well, what I say in Latin America is: listen, if if the role of government is guaranteeing life, liberty, and private property, it is justifiable that you go and you overthrow that government when neither your life nor your private property or your liberty are being guaranteed. And that's where you are, you know, like、uh, you are in your right to overthrow that government. By that rule, like almost all the countries in Latin America could could rebel, you know.、Um, but is there anything in the objectivist philosophy that justifies the use of violence to overthrow a government that is not doing their proper role or not? So I think there's something else you need to justify a rebellion,、mm -hmm. other than that the government isn't doing its proper role. And it's that you have an alternative in mind that will. Okay. So if this government is horrible,、uh, and you want to rebel to get your own horrible gang,、uh, I don't think you have any right to do that. It's two gangs without any right behind them.、No. If you look at the the Declaration of Independence of America, which I think is the uh, the um, really brilliant document on this, right? It's you have a right to. Uh, abolish existing forms of government and erect new ones.、Mm -hmm. When you think doing that will help to protect rights,、yeah. when that's what will secure rights. And so, if you are、uh, in the United States or in Canada or in Honduras or in wherever you are, and you think, and in some places it's more plausible than others. Yeah, Honduras it's more plausible than the other two I mentioned. Oh right, yeah, that、um, the government is awful.、Um, okay, what is it that you want to set up in its place? And if your answer is just some other version of the same horrible thing, yes, I don't think you have. You're neither right nor wrong. You're just one more of the gang. Yeah. If your view is,、uh, I want to set up a rights-respecting government, you have it perfectly right. You have it at least way closer than the government you're in, and that's what you're fighting to protect or to preserve. Then I think you're in the right. But if that's really what you want to do, yeah, and if you have enough people behind you. That it's possible for you to win by military might and by overthrow. In all but the worst situations, there's a better way to do it. I remember that I I have an anecdote with a Basque friend,、mm -hmm. and I remember、uh, they were watching the the football match,、uh, La Copa del Rey, the the Kings Cup of Spain,、uh -huh. and it was the Atleti of Bilbao from the Basque country against the Sevilla team. And and I see my Basque friend who is all about you know making the the Basque country independent,、uh, super excited watching the Kings Cup, and I'm like, wait a minute, you want your team to win the cup of a country whose king you want to have independence? His answer was like. Soccer is one thing, politics is another thing, and I'm like, okay, whatever. But let me ask you something: If the Basque country gets independence, what kind of country do you want? And he's like, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, what's it gonna be? Is it gonna be a monarchy? Is it gonna be a republic? Is it gonna be a, a republican monarchy?、Uh, is abortion gonna be legal in your country? What about drugs? Are you gonna have free market? Are you gonna be part of the European Union? And he was like, whoa, 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 Gloria. Those questions are for politicians, not for me to answer. And I'm like, no, that's precisely the mistake of every single revolution, even Latin America independence.、Mm -hmm. When we independence from the Spanish crown, no one thought, what kind of country are we forming?、Uh, the French didn't do it, and that's why it ended up in the regime of terror of Robespierre. The Cubans didn't do it. That's why Fidel Castro ended with a worse dictatorship than Batista. Uh, the Russians. I mean, they overthrow the Tsars, and then they have something that is more horrible.、Um, you know, I think that's exactly right. Almost all revolutions and all violent ones、uh, result in a worse form of government. I think there are two reasons for it.、Uh, one is that the people don't know what they want, and they they're they're rebelling against the status quo, but not for something. And the the only really clear case where it was for something that I can think of.、Uh, And for something good was the American Revolution. the The French Revolution is a little bit more complicated because there were so many different parties in it. But the only clear case was the American Revolution. And generally, when you are, when you have enough people to win the case to to win in a war, if you know,、uh, and you have something good that you're fighting for, in most situations you don't actually need a war. There's a way to do it through the mechanisms, uh, through um, 
through voting, through policy, unless there's a no voting and there's no, um, and there's no uh, free speech. And in those cases, sometimes a war is needed, but it really has to be a war for something. A revolution is only justified when you uh, have something freer you're trying to create. Mm -hmm. And that means the, the only situation in which it's semi-justified in which you don't know what you want mm -hmm. is when it's really as bad as can be. So against the USSR, uh, against the Nazis. Uh, but even there, the countries that have, you know, been done semi-well had some kind of content to their conception of what are we fighting for. And it's what we're fighting for is freedom. And freedom doesn't mean home rule as opposed to foreign rule. Mm -hmm. uh, or at least doesn't only mean that. It means like, you know, you can get a job without some commissar telling you what your job's going to be. You're allowed to go to the church you want to go or go to no church. You're allowed to, you know, the things that they weren't allowed to do under the dictator. And yeah, the things like Basque uh, um, separationism or the people who want Quebec not to be part of Canada, yeah. um, these are not people who are interested in freedom. Uh, that's not what those movements are about. That's true. Uh, there's one thing that uh, Harry Bingswanger points out in uh, page 2000, uh, 230 about libertarians taking a shortcut. He says, Libertarians take a shortcut. They plagiarize Ayn Rand's principle that no man may initiate the use of physical force and treat it as mystically revealed, out of context absolute. This one principle, deprived of its philosophical base, is expected to replace jurisprudence, constitutions, legislatures, and courts. Then they imagine that the rest of us are obligated to accept on faith any gang's promise that their use of force will be retaliatory. Mm -hmm. So maybe this uh, has something to do with, with, the, with the hopes that people put in a revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and they don't know what's going to come after the revolution, but, but maybe that this explains why. Yeah, I think I can see that. I think part of what's going on here is this idea that to really be for freedom and to really think about what it would mean to implement freedom, to think about how difficult it is to do retaliatory force right. So think about uh, if, if you, if there was no government here and, you know, you thought, uh, you know, this guy running the camera had robbed you and your guy, I didn't see him rob you, no one else here saw him rob you, but you think he did. Uh, maybe you could even prove it to yourself. Uh, and you're now going to ex you're going to you know go take it back from him and beat him up or whatever. You're going to use force on him retaliatorily. If you really thought about, suppose I was in that situation, and I want to be clear that it's retaliatory. Mm -hmm. I want to be clear to everyone else involved that I'm not a threat to them. Right. Because you know if you just go and start executing force again, you start beating someone up next to me. I have every reason to fight back against you. And she's shown herself to be some crazy woman who's just going to beat people up. Now I've got to be afraid of her. I got to fight back. Suppose you're really taking it, and that you're attacking this guy is an effect. You're using force against me. You're threatening me by showing that you're this dangerous brute, right? So suppose you're taking really seriously. I want to use force to retaliate against him, and I want to make sure I'm doing it in a way that leaves everybody else safe. Yeah. That doesn't violate it. I want to make clear that I'm about rights, and I'm using this retaliatory force to protect rights not because I'm just some vendetta crazy woman, right? So think about what you'd have to do. Well, you'd have to, first of all, make it clear to me and to the other people in the room why you're doing this. Yeah. And not only that, you'd have to make it clear, not just that you have a good reason to do it, but that you respect our judgment in the matter. Mm -hmm. Because suppose you say, here's my reason, and I say, yeah, I don't think that's a good reason. And you're like, to hell with you, I'm sure he did it. Well, now I still think she's going to kill me next. How do I know? You, so you've got to make it like, all right, I see all these other people are affected by what I'm doing. Yeah. I see they're all having force introduced to their environment by my doing this. They have to know that I'm being reasonable in this use of force. And part of my being reasonable is they have to know that in effect they have much as much say over this as I do. Okay. I haven't taken it into myself like I'm the law around these parts. Yeah. And um, only if you do that, you find a way to get us all to have buy-in to it and all to have as much control over this use of force as you do. Unless you do that, we are at your mercy of your, however Harry put it, your promise that this force is retaliatory. Otherwise, we don't know. 
And so then you think, well, what would you have to do? You'd basically have to create a government. Or you'd have to create the nearest approximation to a government you could in the time you had. Like, hey guys, I think uh, Colin Robney, um, uh, I think we got to search his pocket, uh, but I'm not going to do it unless you guys agree that that's what happened. Here's how we're going to do it. And you'd have to come up with some mechanism among the 10 of us in the room or whatever it is to, uh, I'm breaking the fourth wall and the illusion we're just two, but among the bunch of us in this room to, um, you know, get, get that. Now, once you realize that that's what you'd have to do in a group of 10 people mm -hmm. to exercise force in a responsible, reasonable, rights-protecting way, even in retaliation, yeah. then think of what that would be, mean to do it at scale in a society. Well, you're going to have to have some kind of mechanisms of representation. You're going to have to have, so, uh, and it's going to have to be some way that nobody is empowered to use force just on his own. Mm -hmm. And there's some principle that everyone is buying into or at least the society as a whole is buying into, maybe not every single individual, by which the use of force is subordinated to moral principles and to a process of adjudication. And unless you have that, you're basically threatening everybody when you're using force. And what anarcho-capitalism is, is the idea that, well, the market can provide that yeah. by, you know, market forces, and I patronize this defense agency, and you patronize that one, and then they'll come to some kind of treaty or whatever. But all of that is thinking that a market can get the, unilater the unilaterality out of the use of force. But right. it can't because th there's still force on that market. Uh, and that is something that, uh, for me, makes anarchists similar to Marxists. Marxists uh, have this blind faith in that there will come a point where the human being will have no self-interest and he will voluntarily give some of his property to the to the people that don't work as hard as they do. That was Marx's uh, original idea. There will be a new man, and this new man will renounce to his self-interest to the point that even if he works more than, than his neighbor, he will be uh, voluntarily uh, giving up what is rightfully his in order for everyone to have equality of property. Well, in that same sense, I, it seems to me that anarcho-capitalists deposit all this faith in the, in the thought of if we only have free market mm -hmm. and everyone benefits from uh, an absolute uh, free market, then no one will uh, have the need to uh, violently use force uh, against another human being unfairly, but 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 it seems to me that is uh, the same the same utopia, just like uh, to the other side. Yeah, and it's very similar to the the point you and I off camera were talking about before, mm -hmm. of um, th this kind of idea that some uh, libertarians have, whether they're anarchists or not, yeah. of the, the market is magic. The market will just fix it. We start by introducing the market, and the market will solve everything. And you don't think about, well, why does the market work? What is it that makes market work? Where do markets come from? Yeah. What is it about human beings that enables them to produce all these great things in a condition of a free market and not in another condition? Yeah. And you really need to understand that to really understand the value of markets. Otherwise, you have the market as a kind of what Rem calls a, a stolen concept, an idea that's um, taken without the ideas that are the foundation of it. Yeah. And so what do you need to have a free market? Well, you need... Uh, and for markets to do what they do. Mm -hmm. You need individuals leading their own lives uh, by their own reason in a situation where they're secure in their lives and property from the implementation of force by others. Mm -hmm. And to say that you can create that situation via a market yeah. is to not understand what a market is and what it requires. You don't have the market I, yet, and so the market won't work yet. I constantly say that to people in Latin America because they complain about materialism and consumerism and the sons and daughters of drug dealers or cronists who behave terribly and, uh, and, and, and who behave terribly because they, they put more value into things than into people and they are racist or classist. And I said, listen, it's not up to the market to be your ethics teacher 
or your philosophy teacher. That's something that needs to be uh, taught at home. Like, what are your family values? Is, is your family teaching you that people have dignity, that individuals should be treated equally, regardless of if they have money or not? I mean, people sometimes blame the market for the lack of morality of human beings when it's not the market's uh, job to, to be your ethics professor, you know? And they imagine that the market will, will solve problems that what the market does is enable them to solve it and they're not gonna, they don't. So I had a, was one sitting in an economics class I was asked to co-teach a unit on it. Mm -hmm. And somebody brought up um, racism and gender, uh, you know, sexism. And you know, some uh, issue in some industry where women are paid less. Uh -huh. And now there are all kinds of questions about whether it's true that women are paid less in this yeah. the field or if they are, whether it's because of their choices. But the, the one of the economists there said, it can't be the case that women are paid less. Because if they were, well, the market would have corrected it already. Somebody would have opened up another business that paid women less, of only a little bit less, and all of a sudden it would have been outcompeted. And that's not true. Yeah. I mean, it's true that someone could open up that business, but someone would have to do it. And you can't imagine that it's already been done. And maybe the reason women are paid less is because enough people in the society are sexist yeah. that nobody would want to patronize the business that had women worked for. So, you can't blame markets for that state of affairs. It's not markets that caused it. But you also can't assume that these unjust states of affairs can't happen because markets are magic. They're not magic. What they are is the freedom. Uh, the, a free market is a situation in which people are free to interact voluntarily and in which the better people are able to do, without exercising force, the things they need to do to improve the society. And if you think you can improve it better by exercising force, yeah. you can't. Because the same prejudices that are at work in that society that are making the bad situation, even in the case of a free market, yeah. are going to make it uh, in some other way and in a way that the better people can't escape from it if you enter my And you see that happen in America with racism, which was not stopped by the laws that were supposed to stop it and in some ways were more entrenched, exactly. and with sexism and with other things. Now, uh, now that we established all of this, uh, isn't it contradictory that Ayn Rand is the creator of one of the biggest anarcho-capitalists that exists? Like, wasn't John Galt the ultimate anarcho-capitalist? I mean, here you have a guy that says, uh, screw the government, I will do my own community, and I will start convincing everyone that I think uh, is fit to work in a market system to come and live in my gulch. Uh, what would you answer to people that, that think of John Galt as the ultimate anarcho-capitalist because he refuses to live under a government? So there are two points about Galt. Um, one is that he's fictional and she didn't think that could really happen. But two, even what he's doing isn't anarcho-capitalist. So Galt is someone who's trying to reform his society. He's trying to, he has a tactic, a strike. A strike isn't a different way you're going to live, like in business. This is how it's going to be from now on. It's something you do temporarily to create a change, right? Okay. And so Galt is someone who has a strike. He's withdrawn the most productive people from society mm -hmm. in order to precipitate the collapse of society so that he can start a new society. And he has, it's pretty clear what the new society is going to be. It's going to be the United States Constitution. Uh, with a couple of changes to it. And one of the changes is Congress will make no law on um, restraint of trade, basically. So it's, we're going to separate uh, economy and state. Um, in the meantime, as part of the tactic, uh, some of his friends who are part of this fight, part of this strike, uh, decide to live together as a small group in a mountain retreat. Um, and there's no government in the mountain retreat. But even there, uh, it's not a country which has a lot of people in it who necessarily disagree. It's a private club. Okay. And even in the private club, they find it necessary to create a kind of arbiter in case of dispute. They, they think we need an objective mechanism and nobody could be in this club who doesn't agree that we're going to have Narragansett sorted out if we ever uh, get into a dispute. Um, so even there, it's not um, really what anarcho-capitalism would be. And it's a temporary measure in a club of private individuals who are in the midst of, in effect, fighting a war. A war to try to create a society that would have a proper government. And then here's back where I say this is fiction. Uh, she didn't think it could really happen on anything like that time scale. And she didn't think you could really get as many people as were even in the gulch and have them not have any conflicts. And uh, so that's the fiction, you know, idealized element of it. 
but he's not an anarcho-capitalist. And the, what the Galt has is, is an anarchy, and it's not a society. And what we're talking about when we talk about capitalism, socialism, anarchy, feudalism, these are systems by which a society can function. Mm -hmm. And a society, or fail to function, but a society is a large group of people living in the same geographical region who aren't all friends or relations. New people come in or are born. Uh, it's not a club of a small number of people, all of whom bought in and made an agreement with one another. Okay. If you're just dealing with like the rules for these eight guys on a boat who are in the middle of the ocean, that's not a society. And there are still principles about how they have to live together, but it's, they're not the same ones. But some anarcho-capitalists think that the way it would work is like with these micro-communities self-governing each other, like the, in the size of suburbs, right? And uh -huh. the, like the world would have mm, millions of these micro-communities, and that's the way that anarcho-capitalism will work. You think so, that not even like that? I don't think it's true, but if you take those communities, yeah. here's the question we have about the communities. Are the communities little countries? So maybe they're little countries. They're like city-states, uh -huh. like ancient Athens or ancient Sparta or yeah, something. Yeah. If the communities are city-states, then what they have is a government. There's a government in this community. Yeah. And you decide, um, no, I don't like this government. I'm going to go to the competing government. But what you mean by that is I'm going to move to this other country. Yes. It's just the countries are very small. Yeah, like around the corner. Right. And within each country, though, there is a government, and the government makes the laws and so forth. So that I don't think is really anarcho-capitalism. It's just the view that countries should be a lot smaller than they are. Exactly. Or um, governments more decentralized, decentralized as possible. Well, smaller, because the, the centralized, if they all have an overarching government, and but most of the activities are the smaller government, then yeah. that, but, but all of these are questions about once you really have governments, a government is a monopoly on the use of force within a geographical area. Um, uh, What's a good size for a government to be? Not size is how much of the, how much is control of your life, but I mean like, you know, should a country be as big as the United States or as small as Rhode Island mm -hmm. or uh, Portugal? What about something like Vatican City? You know, what, how big or small is the territory? And I think, you know, you can have countries that work that are a lot of different sizes. I don't think you could have a million tiny city states, but I don't think that's an issue with this level of political philosophy. I just think it wouldn't be efficient. It wouldn't work. They'd want to merge. Um, but I don't think that's what anarcho-capitalism is really about. The other issue is, well, they're not really governments. What they are is, I own land and you own the land next to me, yeah. and we get together and we decide that we are the, the rulers of this land. Right. And we have this system, and he owns land three blocks away, and he's the ruler of that system. But then we're not ruler, we're, it's not capitalism, it's, um, it's feudalism. The people with different lands are the feudal barons of the land, and you don't have any distinction between um, jurisdiction over land, which is what a government has, and ownership over land, which is what an owner has. And when you, have, you don't have that distinction, then you are living in a state of anarchy and a state of feudalism, which are really what anarchy amounts to in practice, is a kind of feudalism. There's turf, and what I say goes on this turf. Uh, no matter what I want to do to you on this turf, you're on my turf so I can beat you up or whatever. Mm. Uh, if the, someone calling himself an anarcho-capitalist just favors very um, small states, I don't think that's really what the view is. I don't think that's what Rothbard's view was and so no. forth. And um, I think it's not the same view. They shouldn't call it that. And I think it's, uh, it's probably not, not a good system, but it's, it's not wrong at the level of principle in the way these other things are. It's just impractical to have a state that's you know the size of the I, post I was going to ask you that like why why do you think that no anarcho capitalist uh, experiment has uh, happened in reality because i mean uh, in politics we see all the time people choosing terrible ideas right now you have socialism of the 21st century destroying venezuela so even if something is impractical or if it's wrong or if it's unjust uh it, it has been tried politically. Why do you think that there hasn't been an anarcho-capitalist experiment? Well, in a certain sense, I think mafias are anarcho-capitalist experiments. Right. And there have been them. They're just, you know, not done by people with bow ties. Um, it's a joke because a lot of the NCAPs were bow ties. But it's not done by people with bow ties who are um, eloquent about what they're doing. Right. But I don't think, and who talk about rights. But I don't think it's really that different from what the Crips and Bloods were doing. Um, but if they want to try an experiment that's uh, 
you know, where they wear their bow ties and talk in a more civil way about what they're doing. You know, they're welcome to try it. They've just not tried it. And I think the reason they haven't is it's a... Um, I don't think that people who are really thinking seriously about uh, um, improving improving life I mean, and about what to do, I think it's a kind of, this is again Rand's idea, this is something that's very detached from reality. I think it's a kind of intellectual bauble for people uh, rather than a real program for trying to live, even in the way that people hold it who hold it. Well, great. Thank you very much for uh, clarifying all these questions. I, I think that uh, now we have more to, to study up on why anarcho-capitalism not only uh, shouldn't be part or considered like a, a, a freedom movement, but also like seriously consider how it harms freedom. And we're going to talk uh, about the proper roles of government uh, to see, okay, now that we understand that a government should exist, what should that government do? And how can we prevent that government from falling into corruption or cronism or uh, injustice?